So it is so important for founders to have a support system of like-minded people who can tell you it's okay. And if you can find that support system, such near-death scenarios surely help you to be alive. Nobody needs uh, gyan, but uh, nobody wants people to come and solve their problems. What founders really need is to know that other people also have similar problems, right? And everybody's in the same boat. And that gives, for some unknown reason, a lot of comfort to founders. I didn't realize that I was, the feeling that I had was loneliness. I always felt it was responsibility. I'm the last man standing, I need to, it's my thing. But it took me a whole lot of time, long time to figure out that it was a loneliness that I was going through, not dealing with the responsibility. What's been your relationship with health? I think more than physical health, as a founder, I think we need more help on the mental side. For all the troubles we keep to ourselves. Being an entrepreneur is a, a journey of self-discovery. You would probably uh, discover a lot more things about yourself than what you have. Uh, something that I would kind of pity uh, my friends. So they go through their entire life without even realizing who they are. I would say that I'm guilty of ignoring my health during those 10 years and it's, it's a journey to discover my place on earth and how much ever I can contribute to people around me. I run. I never feel that I'm too stressed and stuff like that. I go for an hour and I come back, I'm so exhausted that uh, I don't have a choice but to sleep. You wake up, uh, you are more energized. Our guests today were Prashant Pitti and Raghu Nandanji. Prashant yeah. is the co-founder of Ease My Trip. Ease My Trip is among very few consumer startups in the world that bootstrap all the way till IPO and later even became a unicorn. Raghu is the founder of Zolve. Zolve is world's first cross-border neobank. Before Zolve, Raghu built and sold ride-hailing startup Taxi for sure to Ola for $200 million. We explored a bunch of topics, topics like the importance of sleep, what were the scariest moments while building their companies and how did they persist through it? the importance of physical and mental health. We talked about desires, support system, and loneliness, and much more. Now I bring you Prashant and Raghu Nandanji. So the conversation today is gonna be a bit different. It's not gonna be about finding product market fit, how to raise capital, how to pick a problem in a big market. It's gonna be around the importance of physical and mental well-being. So building a company can be very lonely. We'll be covering topics like loneliness, support system, and many other things. So let me introduce uh, Prashant Pitti. So before coming here, I was able to book my flight tickets and hotel through Ease My Trip. And it was very convenient, <laughs> seamless, and it was very cheap uh, out of all the other providers. I didn't ask you to pitch in, okay? He's already, <laughs> he's already exited the company. There's no need to pitch. No, no, no I didn't exit. Okay. No, no, I didn't exit, no. Oh. <laughs> and Raghu, uh, I wish he had started what he's doing right now a bit earlier when me and Prashant were in US. Uh, he is providing financial services to Indians living in the US. And before that, he founded a company called Taxi for Sure which he ended up selling it to Ola. So to start with, uh, how are you both sleeping these days? <laughs> Prashant, go first. Uh, terrible question to start with. <laughs> Last night I slept for three and a half hours and I become like almost speech impaired when I sleep less. So I, will, I told him that I would want him to do the most heavy lifting in this entire conversation, but yes, uh, my aura ring tells me my average sleep is for about six and a half hours these days and you know um, I'm just about to turn 40. Uh, I think uh, till early 30s or mid 30s it was fine you know you could go away with four hours, four and a half hours, five hours but now the age is surely catching up and uh, I feel like if I'm not done six and a half, seven hours um, I feel like the next day definitely takes a toll and one way I know for sure it takes a toll is I, I do end up playing chess uh, two, three games on daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I have actually monitored uh, my performance in chess on the basis of my sleep cycle. So the days I sleep less, I easily lose 60 to 70% of the games. And the days I sleep better, uh, you know, my, my chess rating improves. So, and I believe running a startup is something similar to say that. 
So hence, I, have, I mean, on the basis of this uh, context, I've been able to understand that how much of an importance the sleep definitely has on your startup. I have to answer the same question. Yeah. Oh, I, I sleep for uh, six hours. And uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So I sleep for six hours. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Not missing much though, but <laughs> I'll use the mic. <laughs> uh, right, so sleep for six hours. Um, uh, in the office also, we have a room uh, with beds in them. Right, so, and uh, some of the companies that I invest in, I force them to have a sleeping room in the office because uh, you need to sleep when you need it, not just because the day turns, day becomes night. Yeah. Right, so well rested mind is always better than uh, something which is really, really taxing and stuff like that, right? And uh, as founders, we don't get to choose the actual sleeping hours. Right, uh, you go to bed with a worry, you wake up with a solution. <laughs> so then it doesn't matter whether you are sleeping in during the daytime or in the nighttime and stuff like that. So kind of uh, stick to it. At times um, uh, when, the, when the stress levels are high and stuff like that, uh, I, uh, even though I'm on the bed, you don't get to sleep much. All right, so you are just uh, twisting and turning and things like that. But uh, there is no way for us to really do that. And um, I prefer, uh, because I run a US business sitting out of India, I keep traveling to the US a long time. So kind of prefer those long haul flights, no internet, even though there is Wi-Fi available in the flight, we, I don't take it, yeah. right? Sometimes I uh, read books, actual books, not Kindle, so that uh, <laughs> no warm light and things like that. But uh, those long duration, long haul flights are amazing, right? Uh, for uh, sleeping and things like that. So that, that that's how I uh, do it. and. Um, some of the times I know that, uh, so caffeine is something that I control, right? So beyond uh, 3 p.m. I usually don't have uh, caffeine. So that kind of impacts, uh, right? However uh, stressed I am and stuff like that, I uh, try to avoid uh, caffeine. And um, yeah, so whenever, uh, so I run, uh, I run a lot. So whenever I feel that uh, I'm too stressed and stuff like that, uh, what I do is uh, I go for a run in the night. Uh, right. So when I come back, I'm so exhausted that uh, I don't have a choice but to sleep. Yeah. Uh, right. So in the morning, uh, I mean, you wake up, uh, you are more energized uh -huh. after a good night's sleep. Actually, that does not work for me. It makes me even more miserable. <laughs> the moment, say, if I'm not able to sleep, I I tried this multiple times that I would go to gym, I would work out, and now my body's tired and my mind is tired. <laughs> I'm awake even more afterwards. I've, I've, you know, I wish it would, work, it would work for me that well, but it really doesn't. And what's something that works for you, Prashant? Melatonin. Ah. <laughs> Melatonin works really well for me. And then also, no matter how dark the room is, I, I find a very clear, you know, difference between the nights when I put my eye mask on and the nights I don't. Uh, somehow, I must force you to keep your eyes shut. And it literally gives your brain signal that hey, it's time to stop thinking. So melatonin and eye mask, they work really well for me now. Yeah. So I will figure it out and I will not give up. So basically what that means is it's persistence and being resourceful. And while building uh, is my trip and while building uh, taxi, my, taxi uh, Taxi for sure, and then now Zol, uh, Raghu and Prashant. What were the scariest uh, moments while you when, while you were building uh, your companies, and you were able to persist through, and you were resourceful enough to figure it out? Maybe give raw examples. How were you able to navigate it through? You want to start? That's okay. Look in the past. <laughs> the latest thing. Hmm. Uh, okay, so I'm sure uh, just like Raghu and I, I'm sure you all would be able to relate with this because every startup goes through 10 different near-death experiences. And uh, so did we. Uh, Is my trip had relatively different journey. Uh, we grew this company Bootstrap, never raised capital. In fact, Is my trip till today is Bootstrap. Uh, the company went public about three years ago. Uh, so, uh, and the only money which we put in in the first six years of running company. Later on, we could take some debt and uh, we, we put in about three, four crores uh, in the sixth and seventh year, I believe. But in the first five years, uh, the only money which went in each my trip, uh, which we put in was 15 lakh rupees, uh, one five. So we were always and always uh, short on money. You know, literally, 
to hire a product manager for a salary of let's say one one and a half lakh rupees a month, uh, we would budget it uh, six months later. This is how the company ran for a really long time. We we took our sweet time in hiring. We took our sweet time in saying yes. In fact, one thing which uh, I think running a bootstrap company uh, made me who I am is being extremely disciplined and saying no very easily. Uh, for me, no comes much more naturally than yes. And uh, yes only, like every part of your body must say yes, then only a yes comes out. Which, which, which is something which we have developed over the period of time. Now, in terms of company, going bust, I can talk about many instances, but since it's a public listed company, I would share the information which I might have shared in the past. Uh, so this, this one basically happened right three months later after the you know, inception of Ease My Trip. Uh, initial version of Ease My Trip was a B2B company where we were just serving a software to travel agents. Now, one of the travel agents outsmarted us uh, this guy used fake credit card and booked tickets worth 26 lakh rupees. This was September 2008. Uh, the company started in June 2008. So this guy used fake credit card and all of his passengers flew the very same night uh, to Oman, I believe. He had about 200 odd passengers who were flying to Oman. Now, we, we did give him a credit uh, for a couple of days, and but then it was a fly-by-night guy and uh, the guy couldn't be founded and we couldn't get the money from the, uh, from the credit card company for multiple reasons. And at that time, uh, I almost decided to write an email to my ex-boss. I was working for HSBC in Chicago, telling him that uh, I made a huge mistake. <laughs> I should not have quit and please take me back. And uh, so did my brother. My brother was also working somewhere. And we both almost decided that, you know, it was a terrible idea to do something like this because now we are in debt, huge debt. Uh, the money is lost. And uh, I think the difference between, I don't know what would you call this, uh, sanity or insanity that we persisted. And, but the sanity or insanity, whatever way you want to look at it, persisted only because we had a couple of people who were, who were saying us, it's okay, you know, it's okay, give it another shot, it's okay. And when you're hanging by the cliff at such moment, whatever first advice you get, because you can't think very clearly yourself at that moment, right? Whatever first advice you get is usually the kind of thought process you start developing towards. I'm very, very sure if uh, my father, mother, few of our friends, at that moment, I told her, yeah, you know, go back to your job, leave it. I'm pretty sure we would have done that, you know, because if those people are saying it and you're so insecure, so scared at that moment, you would just take the advice of whomever you look up to and just do, right? Rather than deciding from your own side because you clearly know you fucked up, your decisions didn't work well at that moment. So. Hence, it is so important for founders to have a support system of like-minded people who can tell you it's okay. You know, it was a mistake, but move on. Don't be hungover uh, on that mistake. And if you can find that support system, dealing with such problems, dealing with such near-death scenarios uh, would surely keep you, would surely help you to be alive. That, that's, that's one recommendation I think I have. Uh, great. Uh, for somebody who is on a second startup, no, I'm uh, uh, fairly stupid to do it the second time because the first time itself was so terrible, <laughs> uh, right? So my, multiple times, as he rightly said, right? I, I don't know. I, uh, I can't remember the good days that I had. Uh, it's always been uh, terrible, uh, right? So someone, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's a true story. It's a true, it is a true story, right? And the, I, mean, I think I'll not probably talk about the same things, right? So funding is a challenge. Right? And what you think the product should do and what it actually does is not the same thing. Right? The people that you hire, you think that they will do this and they'll take this load off you. They don't do it. They add more load to you. So those are common problems that you guys have experienced and stuff like that. Right? And that I think is uh, you get company. Uh, what I've observed is um, nobody needs uh, Gyan. 
right i think there is a whole lot of gyan that is available in the market uh, right but uh, nobody wants uh, people to come and solve their problems what founders really need is to know that other people also have similar problems right and everybody is in the same boat and that gives for some unknown reason a lot of comfort to founders right uh, there is somebody just like me who is in the same boat as me and somebody is probably standing in the front of the boat or probably I'm standing in the back of the boat and stuff like that but all of us are in the same boat that gives a lot of comfort because people are smart enough to solve their own problems right they don't need people to uh, solve their problems so something that i will probably share uh, where we had some fundamental uh, uh, alignment on should we continue not continue is um, uh, so i used to run the taxi business right uh, there is a bunch of uh, drivers uh, who used to uh, not uh, bother about any kind of customer experience they don't they wouldn't want to call uh, clean the car uh, right you give them warning and uh, they would treat the customers badly right so one driver to just because the customer wouldn't uh, speak kannada he just dumped the customer right in the middle of the no- road uh right so stuff like that so after repeated feedback and things like that people don't improve what do you do what do you guys do people, right you let them go right that's the most obvious thing right i was also equally smart uh right so i let them go right so we let them go at around 10:30 in the morning we had called them to office let them go at around 10:30 11 in the morning and stuff like that and we thought it was done and dusted so you continue uh doing the work uh right and um, at around uh, uh, 12 uh, in midnight or 1 am these four drivers come, get completely drunk come to the office <laughs> right so me my co-founder not in the office it's only the night shift guys uh, right who are there they come and ransack the entire office all right so they break the uh, desktops all right so then we used to do for the customer support we used to have uh, desktops only so they break the desktops and everything they uh, the glass doors are broken everything is there and they're drunk and by the time uh, me and my co-founder reached the office they have left right all thankfully the, uh, huh? thankfully they left <laughs> but all that, that uh, we would have done we didn't know how to deal with it and stuff like that right so we go and the, all the night shift folks are like terrified hmm. my god what is this we never subscribed to this and stuff like that and uh, then we go to so our office was in jp nagar uh we go to the jp nagar police station in the night and there they said that the inspector is not there come tomorrow morning mm. right so as we asked what time the inspector comes at 8 in the morning so we don't have anything else to do so like okay tomorrow morning next day morning 8 o'clock uh, we go mm. right so the night shift uh, hands out the morning shift at 6 am in the morning right so nothing much has changed yeah. Uh, yeah. from there and stuff like that the morning shift guys also know that oh, a lot of the ruckus has happened in the night so they're also terrified what will happen and stuff like that what if the drivers come back in the morning and they do something because the night shift guys are only boys the morning shift has a uh, few girls also in them all right so and we also don't know so at 8 o'clock we go to the police station uh, obviously the inspector is not there uh, at 11 in the morning the inspector comes to the police station and we are at the police station from 8 to 11 all right he comes enter the police station with the four drivers <laughs> so they know the modus operandi how to do this so me and my co-founder are there standing mm. right so the inspector walks in walks in and the drivers are like oh, these two yuri bre yuri bre i don't know how many people understand uh canada <laughs> yuri bre yuri bre and, like, and the police inspector okay you two stand in the corner the four drivers start sit in front of the police inspector and we are there in the corner <laughs> right and that guy is not even inspector is not even re- ready to listen to the story uh, right and those four drivers sit and stuff like that so uh, tell these guys to take us back and the inspector is like take them back and we like no <laughs> we can't take them back if you take them back the entire thing is collapsed right? then then we will. so lot of drivers are on the edge they can fall this way or that way if you take the bad drivers back mm. so even the people who are on the edge will not behave properly right right so then the entire business will collapse yeah. mm. so it's like so till that happens uh, right you guys stand there only and the four drivers are sitting in front of the inspector and stuff like that after 2 o'clock happens no lunch no coffee nothing right so till 6 pm in the evening we are like made, made stand in the corner as if we are the ones who are there and the photo and we know that the morning shift guys have handed over to the afternoon shift guys we know that everybody in the company knows now whatever that has happened and stuff like that so everybody is looking what will happen and me and my co-founder also are thinking what did we subscribe for right so we started the company in june this was uh, somewhere in uh, october november right so both of us are from i am on the path right uh, we were in a, so and this is 2011 mind you and uh, being a founder was not sexy 
so it was the most stupidest thing to do right being uh, an entrepreneur was as close to being unemployed yeah so my relatives stopped uh, inviting me to family functions mm. because i'd become a taxi driver and some of my relatives started questioning whether i actually graduated from iima or not because you don't put up your degree certificate in the hall no <laughs> so if that guy was so smart why didn't he go in iim bangalore i'm from bangalore why didn't he end up in iim bangalore why did he have to go to all the way to iim of the bus gujarat to study and stuff like that i don't think so it's from iim only and if he's a graduate from iim of the bus why is he driving taxis because we drove taxis <laughs> so as a founder you need to really uh, understand what the drivers go through so we actually took my car and we ferried car fast just and my car, my relatives knew that i was driving ta- driving around with taxis and stuff like that they thought no i am degree and stuff like that taxis so everything happened so we were like thinking what did we do why did we end up in this and why are we in the police station all right should we continue doing this not doing this or that those were the things that we fundamental questions that we asked right i don't know how many of you would have continued running uh, the taxi business like this right where everybody is there and stuff like that thankfully uh, i mean my mom and my mom uh, right she called me at around 6 to check whether I, i will come home for dinner or not so then i was like in the police station since morning mm-hmm. so my mom uh, really got sight thankfully uh, uh, my sister is an ips officer my own sister is an ips officer my mom heard that i was in the police station called my sister and my sister was in uh, delhi she thought that i been behind the bars and people gave me third degree certificate uh, treatment and stuff like that she got and thankfully just like engineering colleges uh, ips has very few women so because of which everybody, everybody just like engineering colleges yeah. across the batches you know all the girls no yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right in ips also across the batches everybody knows the only few girl ips officers so my sister knew almost everybody so and uh, and that guy the inspector again comes back and tells out okay who is ragu i told him i am ragu are you stupid <laughs> was like why your sister is an ips officer what are you doing why didn't you tell me and he makes us both of us sit in front of the inspector and tells the four drivers to go get out <laughs> all right so apparently the so those guys had gone to the corporate in the morning the corporate had called the inspector and the corporate told that okay my vote bank Mm. ensure that they don't go so then i got my ips of sister involved so she has a higher in the power hierarchy right she is at a higher level than the corporator <laughs> right the police is just following that right <laughs> so then he threw us out uh, then they he threw the thing drivers out and stuff like that then the drivers i don't know because they couldn't understand what is it they figured out that we are very very influential and things like that right so we went back but i think uh, that when you stand in the corner of a police station but from 8 am to let's say 6 pm and stuff like that right you ask some fundamental questions in life uh right <laughs> so obviously you have so much of time what do you do uh right we were asking those fundamental questions should we continue or not continue and stuff like that that's where i think uh, some things that we decided that they became the culture fabric of the company we don't let the minority decide what will happen to the majority we had 500 drivers then right so those 500 drivers were happy with us we changed their lifestyle we changed their business and things like that right we don't want to let these four people decide what will happen to the majority right and that's that's the thing right so now this is an epiphany uh right so both me and my co-founder like let's do this this is good we should continue and stuff like that but what will you go back and tell the people Some, in the company yeah. because everybody across the board right oh, everybody is like okay ka shocked what to do what if somebody comes again and does this any you know, how will we do it right when you guys are not there how do we do it and so not that if somebody if we are there if somebody comes we'll know what to do with it right so what do you tell the team all uh, right because everybody is scared and stuff like that so that's when we went to the office and we told that and we were like uh, me and my co-founder were laughing when we entered the office and uh, most of the people thought that uh, we become nut cases <laughs> because uh, there is a chaos everything is broken apart and stuff like that right why are you laughing so that's when we did a um, all hands down all and we told the people that was so we are in the taxi business right and uh, we started this business to disrupt something right if you are going to disrupt something something someone will get offended by the disruption if somebody gets offended by the disruption what do you think they will do they'll come and ransack the office mm. right so soon in our journey so early in our life we have ran we have disturbed somebody somebody has been affected so they come and ransack the office all right so then the people are like okay fine we are doing disruption so the way measure of uh, the disruption is how soon <laughs> the office would get ransacked right so th- we had drivers ran- getting ransacked uh, ra- ransacking our office we had some people who come to office and ransack the office who had nothing to do with taxi for sure <laughs> primarily because the drivers were earning more money some of the personal drivers of people would leave their personal uh, driving job and come and join taxi for sure to drive taxis with the taxi for sure so because they were losing their drivers they would come and ransack the office 
come and shout in front of everybody and stuff like that right that's the thing so then it becomes such a inherent culture thing right so any new office that we started in any other city in india right the measure was how soon the office would get uh, ransacked right bangalore got there in 6 months right the second city that we opened was delhi 2 weeks <laughs> delhi was only 2 weeks so the delhi guys were like super happy right the goddamn chennai 12 months useless folks <laughs> right i think the people don't really have that thing in chennai to come and ransack because everybody even the customer is well behaved even the drivers are well behaved even the staff is well behaved nobody wants to ransack anybody <laughs> right so that effectively become the culture fabric right so once you take some of these things uh, right and weave it in the culture fabric right and make it into the norm you know so uh, hamadabad pune mumbai and stuff like that right the measure was when will it get ransacked some people would get into depression also the chennai branch had got into depression because nobody was coming and ransacking the first uh, whenever we have the review meetings right we used to call the branches to bangalore to, to, for the review meetings the first question that people ask ransack hua hai nahi like no i don't question nahi kar raha so that was that became the norm so yeah so uh, stuff like that so fundamental questions but uh, we change it change it to something much more uh, encouraging believing and uh, doing that so multiple multiple uh, such kind of uh, instances so take take an advisory we ask some fundamental questions uh, right uh, uh, figure out what is that you want to do uh, in life for the company and translating that to something that people understand because you go and tell the company uh, folks that will not let the majority decide what the what will not let the minority decide what the what we should do with the majority nobody will understand nobody could relate to into it but translating into something that people could relate into it becomes the culture fabric and then life becomes a lot more easier and uh, at times right uh, so this is this is another learning that i had uh, because for some strange reason not strange reason because we didn't have funding much right we built the uh, 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 team bottom up i guess most of you will also do that a huge mistake all right so when you build a team bottom up right when you hit scale you don't have people to drive that scale because you don't have any mid level guys at all right and that becomes a uh, a huge uh, uh, challenge and because of which as founders you take the heavy load right you are asking all the other people to execute but you are doing the thinking you are taking the maximum load and things like that right and over a period of time what happens is the entire responsibility or the growth of the company or the survival of the company falls on your shoulders and you continue to run that way and when you get some of the mid level guys senior level guys and stuff like that right because you have been brought up that way in your journey as a founder it's very difficult for you to let it go right when you have capable people and stuff like that right you don't give it to them so my biggest uh, uh, learning there was my cfo so dina she is now the uh, founder of open she told me that ragu this is our company too right why do you make it as if it is only your company and why are you carrying the heaviest load there so just relax right our success and failure are linked to the company only not just yours mm-hmm. just let it go share it i'll uh, share it and that was a huge uh, uh, turning point where i know that i'm not alone right i always felt that i'm answerable to the investors i'm answerable to the drivers the customers the employees everybody there all right so when when you get good team members good to co-founders and stuff like that right who make you feel that you're not alone in this journey and everybody has the same interest irrespective of the equity that they hold in the company and stuff like that right because you don't uh, wear your equity in the company on your sleeve and walk around nobody really knows and sometimes the founders are so busy in execution and stuff like that right? nobody knows the exact number of equity that they hold in the company so it doesn't really matter so once you cross the hurdle right so that's in the back background so everybody shares the responsibility about that the loneliness gets addressed then always felt that for a very very long time i didn't realize that i was the feeling that i had was loneliness i always felt it was responsibility i'm the last man standing i need to, it's my thing and if i if i fail everybody else fail and stuff like that but it took me a whole lot of time long time to figure out that it was a loneliness that i was going through not dealing with the responsibility yeah. right sometimes in even diagnosing what issue that you are going through itself is 90% of the problem solved because once you know the problem we are smart enough to figure, uh, find the solution if you don't know the problem and if you are masking the problem with a different name right we are trying to address the uh, symptom not the core issue right and that's where i think a lot of a uh, lot of challenges lie seems like 
Raghu had started enjoying <laughs> the days uh, <laughs> during Taxi for sure. And anyone starting up in taxi business, reach out to Raghu. I think there's somebody uh, from Shoffer. Shoffer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be ready, man. Uh, so be ready. That's uh, coming. In fact, uh, maybe someone wants to start ransacking as a service. <laughs> <laughs> that you have, man. Go to Delhi. You'll find, you'll find plenty of Delhi them. boys. Man. <laughs> so, Prashant has a ultra human. Uh, or one of his uh, aura. My bad. Uh, I'm an investor in ultra humans. I think you should have that. Uh, and I'm also an investor. Let's beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> and and Raghu, uh, as as you heard, uh, you know, he runs, and I think uh, you've done a bunch of stuff. I uh, would love for you to uh, talk about it. What's been your relationship uh, with health, uh, both physical, mental? Uh, has it been the same? Has it evolved over time? What was the reason? Uh, why did you make few changes? If you did. Uh, and how has it helped you? Yeah, so my relationship with uh, health uh, goes back uh, way back before my uh, 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 entrepreneurship days. Oh, I started uh, running while I was uh, studying in I am Ahmedabad, uh, right? Uh, so because a bunch of uh, guys were running uh, on the ground, I joined them. And the first run I did was the full marathon in Mumbai, uh, right? So 2007, uh, started taxi for sure in uh, 2011. Uh, right, so I've been running. So the thing uh, uh, with the running was, um, so I don't know how many people are like me. So it's very difficult for me to meditate. Right, if I sit at one place and do nothing, no, I sleep off. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, if somebody is giving can, I feel that it's random can. Why are you bothering me, kinds? Right, so it's very difficult. But when I started running, that's when I realized that um, even though you're running in a group, you're alone, and you get and because you can't sleep off because you're running. Right, you get a lot of time to introspect, retrospect, think about things, uh, right? And that would give uh, so much of clarity, right? At the end of the run, uh, run, right, you are physically exhausted, the mind is super fresh because you have got a lot of time to think about and stuff like that, right? So whenever I'm stressed and stuff like that, I just run, uh, right? And over a period of time, I picked up uh, cycling also and then uh, swimming as well. Uh, swimming has been beautiful. You keep your ears under the water, you have a different sensation only. Right? I don't know how many people have experienced it. All right? It's a phenomenal thing. So it blocks off every other noise. Yeah. Yeah. All right? You keep your uh, ears under the water. So then you are all, re literally all by yourself. That, that's, that's been the case. Uh, right? So post, post taxi for sure, um, uh, during taxi for sure, right? So the, one of the challenges that uh, most of my team members used to have with me is that I made it mandatory for everybody who works with me to run. Thank. <laughs> Uh, right, I still do in, uh, no, I, I took it to a different level in uh, Zol though. So, uh, so I got people to start running 5 kilometers. I, I think there was to be yeah, something called Urban Stampede. I don't know how many people remember Urban Stampede in Bangalore. It's a 5 kilometer relay run, 4 people in, your, uh, in a team. So each one has to do 5 kilometers and stuff like that. So it's more corporates. So we started doing that, uh, started doing the Daredevil circuit also. Uh, right, so some of the people who started running because of uh, me torturing them to run, so now become marathoners now, uh, right, and some of them have become founders also. Uh, post uh, Taxi for Sure, started doing um, uh, triathlons because I started biking and learned swimming also, started uh, doing triathlons, uh, right, uh, uh, did uh, quite a few Ironman events. I don't know how many people know Ironman. So, Ironman is a 4 kilometer swim followed by a 180 kilometer uh, cycling and then a 42.2 kilometers uh, run and you have to finish everything in 17 hours right so i learned that, that there are better ways to kill yourself uh, than doing all this uh, right so i started doing that so uh, after i started zol i'm not really a bad boss uh, right but i started getting people to do iron man also now so a lot of people in my team have done uh, the goa uh, iron man so people uh, learn swimming only for this. Uh, so they good people start. I mean, it's a, so they, they they do they do the relay. I do the full all the triads, all the three things myself. But most of my team members, one person does the swimming, another person person cycles, the third person uh, runs. Uh, right. So they have also started picking it up. And uh, so I've seen that uh, people who did cycling in one year, so they want to do swimming the next year. All right. So it's it's a, it's a good good thing. And people have started falling in love with themselves because they never thought that. Uh, they were capable of something like this, right? And uh, that gives a different level of uh, camaraderie also. And because of which what has happened is, uh, 
uh, people's interaction with members of other teams within the company has increased significantly. Mm -hmm. All right, a product guy, uh, right, <coughs> running along with a, a, a customer support person, right, and somebody in the engineering team doing the swimming and stuff like that, right. So a significant amount of team building, all those things are built. I mean, it's very difficult to take the team to a offset once a quarter and ask them to start building a team. Right, so th this way people have figured out that, uh, right, so the bonding is a lot more different and things like that. Yeah. And also what we have done is, um, we have we have taken office in a place where there is no, uh, uh, not much access to street food. Uh, right, uh, so I, I know this was not by design because the office space was cheaper during COVID, we went there. Later we realized that uh, access to street food is limited. So we started offering uh, lunch and dinner at our office only. So there also we kind of uh, figure out what to uh, provide to uh, provide to our team members and stuff like that as well. So that is also something that's uh, uh, that's kind of uh, worked out for us. Uh, even currently, I'm at the state where uh, uh, six months a year I go on extreme uh, diet plan and stuff like that. So May to October is when I uh, follow a very very strict plan because I do most of the events, marathons and. Uh, triathlons, I an events during um, September, October, start training from May and do that. So then there I go for a, towards a very, very strict diet plan, no alcohol, limited socializing and stuff like that. Come Diwali, I'm back. Uh, right? I'm a foodie, so it's just very difficult for me to resist the temptation of food. I just don't want to be a saint. As well, I, I mean, I, as well, we are saffron and move around, right, if I get into that bit. So, but uh, Diwali to uh, April is when I... Uh, Hog a lot, socialize a lot, and stuff like that. Otherwise, uh, uh, those six months, people feel that I become completely antisocial. No alcohol, no parties. Because I sleep at nine, wake up at uh, three, and stuff like that, so that I train before my kids wake up. Yeah. So that's that's been the journey so far. So uh, bad habits. Some of my uh, team members are also replicating it. Some of my uh, uh, founders where I've invested also are replicating it. But uh, yeah, as long as uh, people figure out what works for them. What works for them. Yeah. Man, that's too much to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think I am an accidental founder. Uh, you know, I never thought that this is how the life would pan out for me. Till my 10th standard, all I did was dreamt about sports, played sports. In fact, to the level where it was so hard for my parents to keep me at home that one time my dad locked me up at... 4 p.m. because 4 to 8, I need to be out. I need to be playing, I need to be out. So as an experiment on the eldest child, uh, which usually is the case, uh, many of you probably probably are parent or are going to be parent, you will go through the same journey. Trust me on that. So my dad, he logged me in the room at 4 p.m. Let's see, kya kya karta hai? since he has to go out and he has to play. And I literally banged my head on the door and it started bleeding. Mm. And then they're like, he said, he's out, he's out, he's out, he's out. So let him out, he's out. He won't stop. He won't stop. And uh, I think uh, this, uh, I, I'm, I'm from IIT how, Madras. How old were you? I must be in 8th grade at that time. Who were you playing with? <laughs> <laughs> and what were you playing? <laughs> We'll talk later about that. <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> I got your point. <laughs> now, so, during, during the playtime only, uh, I heard uh, two seniors talk about that some IIT is called and you know, it's a lot, it's a lot. So, I said, what's up, brother? What's up? Then he ran, you play. It's not for you. And then I got a little bit offended. I said, why is it not for me? And then I actually went outside and I bought some magazines and I learned about IIT. The first time I learned about IIT was when I was in 11th grade. Not even like in 10th grade. First time I heard about IIT was in my 11th grade during the summer vacation when I was supposed to be playing. But then I went around and I found some magazines. I learned about it. And then for two years, I did not visit the play fields. And I studied for engineering. And some of my friends thought that Pitti to mar gaya. Since he's not coming to the play field, he must be dead by now. They literally, some of them thought that either he has moved away or he's dead because he's not coming now. So my journey has, with, relates, uh, with relation to the health has always been very sporty kind of a person. During IIT as well, I caught on my bad habits. I, more than exams, I would just 
be found in the sports grounds, whether playing basketball or cricket or football uh, or, or volleyball. So, you know, so I think it was always there in me, but one thing which, which is very different from your journey, uh, my journey has is that during the entrepreneurship time, I could not find much time to, to be as active as probably I should have been. But also looking back, I think if, if I could have dedicated maybe one or two hours on daily basis to health or fitness uh, during those days, it may have helped, but I don't know. You don't live two lives to know which direction it would have gone, right? We, we can only have one life. We only know how things worked out for you. So had I given those times, I don't know what all would have changed. It may have changed for better. It may have changed for worse. But my experience is that for those first 10 years, we were all in. We were just all in. There was no plan B. It was just one goal to survive. And especially for us, you know, it was, we had eight competitors who all had raised more than $100 million each. So we were fighting against literally the whales, right? And they all were very happy to keep bleeding because they had a lot of pockets, deep pockets, right? While we couldn't afford to be loss making. Ease my trip in last 15 years, 60 quarters, we have never had even one single quarter of loss. So, what happened? No, no, no. Okay. So, and that kept us on our toes all the way, you know? And uh, again, one thing which is different from Raghu's journey is that we did build the company bottoms up. And in the building of the company bottoms up, we did, uh, so one of the bigger differentiators between Eastmetrip and all of our competitors was that we actually started as a travel agency ourselves. We were a travel agent in the beginning. And hence we knew how to respond to the customers and what all to be said and what all not to be said, right? And hence, uh, among all our eight competitors, we kept call center in-house. So we were the only ones who ran our own call center. Everybody else has outsourced their call centers. Now, what difference did that make to the company is that right now, of the 1,200 odd people in our organization, we have 300 senior people who are above, you know, above manager level, who have moved from call center department to the other departments. This is how we have, in fact, our current tech head, her name is Karishma. She joined our company as a call center employee at a salary of 8,000 rupees a month. She's, hand, she's a coder right now and she's handling 200 member team of technology. This is, this is how we have grown our people. Our, I think uh, of 20 member product manager team which we have, around 18 of them have come from call center. And who all, who could be better, right, to, to make a better product than the ones who have actually handled calls, who understand customer's pain point. So we have, we have actually shifted a lot of people from call center executive to various other departments. And we did a lot of work around that. So in building all that for, for almost about 10 odd years, uh, I did, I, I, I would say that I'm guilty of ignoring my health during those 10 years, and so, so are my brothers, Nishant and Rikant. We know that we were slogging our asses. We were in office for 16 to 18 hours every day, including Saturdays and Sundays. But uh, in the last few years, since the company went public about three years ago, and maybe a year or two before, actually, I would say the turning point came in when we started realizing that the part of the company has grown beyond, let's say, 10 crores. So there's, there's a mathematical equation as well, which is, and uh, this is my own equation, so please feel free to not follow it. <laughs> my equation is that if you can afford 37.7% of your PAT to replace yourself, then you can actually start, you know, and not like you, for sure. Then you can start basically delegating your job. This is how I've, I've put that equation in mind. I calculated, I did some calculation on the basis of that. So, when you, and for us, when, when we reached this 10 crore pact, we know that now we can spend about 4 crores on hiring right people who, whom we can basically start giving our kind of work to them and be, you know, seeing that they are doing it rightly. So that started happening in year 2019 onwards. And since then, I've, I've come back, I've started playing. You know, I, I of course run, I go to gym. 
I did a little bit of boxing as well. I broke my hand <laughs> while tracking boxing. I got unlearned nerve syndrome. So that still hurts right now. But overall, I think more than physical health as a founder, I think we need more help on the mental side for all the troubles we keep to ourselves, right? I'm very sure we all have this phase or we all are in that phase right now as well where there are hundreds of problems our companies are facing. But it is so hard to describe those problems intentionally or not intentionally to anyone, even to your spouse or, or your investors or your team. And you keep those problems locked inside within yourselves because we are eternally optimistic. We know that there's a problem, but some, somehow we will find a solution to it. That is why you do not oversubscribe to the problem. I think this is the bigger reason why we do not vocally say it because deep down we believe that solve ho jayega. And hence, what's the point of making a fuss around the problem? So I think the biggest thing I did to myself as a service to me was as we hit this 10 crore pad, I decided to basically stay in a monastery for about 30 days, uh, leaving my phone, leaving my laptop behind. And I stayed with about 300 monks. It was high up in the Himalayas. I stayed with them for about 30 odd days. I, our practice would start 6 a.m. in the morning, would end up at 7 p.m. And you know they, they taught me various types of meditation. I, I learned eight different types of meditation. Uh, this is basically a Mahayana course. And in which, and I was exactly like you, like 10 seconds of meditation would kill me. I would rather put my hand in an electric socket <laughs> than, than meditate, right? So, but, but over there I did learn one particular type of meditation which basically can keep me meditated for hours, even now. And I tend to practice it at least once or twice in a week. And there is one particular type of meditation I can, like literally I have to put two, three, you know, alarm clocks to get me out of that meditation. So it's, it's a very powerful technique which I've learned over there and it worked for me. I mean, I'm sure for many people it may not work. Out of the eight different types of meditation, this one specifically worked, works really well for me. So that's something which, uh, which, which really, really helps me. And it, it basically tells me what is our position. So there are two kinds of thought process we can live with, right? One is that we are just blip in the moment. So everything is meaningless, right? Why work so hard? We are just blip in the moment. And the other thought process is that if there is a God, if there is a higher power, which does not exist right now, but it, it works through you. So whatever you do is basically an order from the higher up. And they are making you work because they want to be present on this earth and they are making things do work through you. And if you subscribe to the later one, it becomes easier to find meaning for your purpose. I, I struggled through it. Like I was a hardcore atheist all my life to the level where, so in Rajasthan, I'm, I'm from Delhi, but my family, my folks are from Rajasthan. And we have this uh, Pityoka Mela. Uh, my last name is Piti. We have a Pityoka Mela in Nagore, in which you have to walk 42 kilometers to go to a temple and then pray. Now, all my life, I would walk 42 kilometers with my cousin, but would not step inside the temple. This is how hardcore of an atheist I was. I needed proof uh, for something higher up to tell me that they exist. And I'm not going to go into detail what changed me, but I am gaining my spirituality as we speak uh, since last five, six years. And I believe that I have transitioned from the first thought process to the second thought process where I've started to realize that the meaning of life is that we, since the God cannot be present, since the power cannot be present over here, they are making work happen through you. And that is what drives me to do whatever I'm doing now. Love it. Uh, so one last one before we open it up to the audience. We live in a world of mimetic desire. Uh, we run after things, what's sexy, what the other person is doing. And typically desire is really a contract you're signing with yourself that you'll stay unhappy until you meet that. Uh, what's been your relationship with desire? And also, how do you 
set and manage your own ambition in life? I kind of partially answered this question <laughs> in the last one. Maybe knowing that you were going to ask that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, of course, desires are never ending. And uh, as, as people, we keep moving from one bubble to the other bubble. I remember an email chain between me and my brothers in year 2008, the time when we started Ease My Trip. An email chain which we look back and we literally laugh about it. The email chain simply said that we are going to create a company which is going to be worth 100 crores. We are going to sell that company for 100 crores. And we are going to put that money in the bank. And that time interest rate was about 11%. So we are going to get 11 crores in our bank account. And we will live happily forever afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this was the promise which we made, three of us made to each other, that this is our destiny and this is what we want. Now, of course, that bubble kept changing, right? You can never be happy with the situation you are. I mean, Ismatrip is a listed company now. Our family still owns 70% of the stock. And yet, here I am starting my another venture. Uh, I recently started Optimo, uh, which is into lending space. And uh, a lot of uh, my friends uh, are calling me crazy for that, that uh, haven't you had enough for the last 15 years that you know, you are, you are at it again. And again, since I'm subscribing to the second thought process where I believe that I'm about to turn 40, I still have at least 10, 15 years in me. And if I'm in a position to find a place where, you know, God can work through me for the benefit of some people, then why should I stop? Yeah. So I think as, as, a, as a family which comes from very lower middle, background, we believe that we have very little expenses to take care of ourselves. In fact, uh, we promised our friends that after IPO, we'll do a yacht party, we'll take them to the yacht. Kuch bhi nahi humne kisi ke liye. <laughs> Kuch, literally, I remember the only thing which we did after listing was we just bought some toys for the kids. And that's about it. Uh, so, I believe that it's not something, if, you, if, you, if you're doing things for yourself, then clearly there are different ways by which you will start observing material wealth. But if you are trying to do it for the people, for the benefit of your customers, for serving you know, the world, then you will have a very different yardstick. And you will have very different internal motivation uh, to do things. Uh, and I think anything which comes internally is far, far more stronger. stronger. Then, which comes with external seeking validation approach. Which, uh, very good uh, response. <coughs> so, uh, at least the way I uh, really look at uh, uh, desire, right? So, I feel that uh, uh, hope is a great uh, uh, motivation tool. Uh, fear is better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing motivates than fear. Right, the fear of failure kills. Right, a hope of a better future doesn't. The fear of failure kills us. Uh, right, but uh, desire is uh, phenomenal. Right, uh, so de desire, depending on how you visualize it and stuff like that, right, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's a very very uh, uh, significant tool. If you don't visualize, uh, let's say how things would be, how you would be uh, two years down the line, three years down the line, or five years down the line or the problem that you're trying to solve as part of your startup, how would it change the way people are and stuff like that, right? If you don't visualize, right, we'll never get there, uh, right? Uh, it's very easy to get uh, lost in day-to-day uh, -day execution operations and stuff like that and miss out on the big picture, all right? But if you have this visualization repeatedly, uh, right, it drives you in such a way that uh, whatever the hiccups that you get, I mean, whatever the challenge that you get, right, you would treat them as minor hiccups not as a, a roadblock because you strongly start believing in that visualization. Mm. Sometimes it so happens that you visualize it so uh, often, you feel that that's the reality. And you are just, uh, you, know, you are in the pursuit of that reality, not uh, trying to build a large company and stuff like that, right? So I also, I mean, uh, same South Indian middle class family, so money was never important, uh, right? So you never do things for making money and stuff like that. 
but uh, you visualize, you have a desire, uh, right? Desire could be pursuit of excellence, pursuit of something, uh, right? And you want to leave the world a uh, better place than what it is to be. And you're taking up a problem and you want to solve, solve it the best way that is possible to solve and stuff like that, right? You put all, all of this together and visualize, right? That's where it uh, uh, really comes from. And if not for you, nobody else in the company is thinking about it, right? Investors have their own metric to worry about. The employees, the team has their own metrics to worry about. So they're more interested in their performance appraisal, they're more interested in their uh, compensation and stuff like that. Nobody else will visualize how the future would be. It only falls on to you. So that's, that's, that's where it is. So you need to fall, in. desire is not negative. Uh, you got to fall in love with that uh, desire. If you start falling in love with uh, that desire, right, you start falling in love with yourself, right? And I always, um, uh, I, I learned uh, that uh, being an entrepreneur is a, a journey of self-discovery, right? Uh, no matter the outcome, right? Uh, you would probably uh, discover a lot more things about yourself than what you have. Uh, something that I, 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 I kind of pity uh, my friends, uh, right? So they go through their entire life without even realizing uh, who they are and what they were capable of just because they i mean i mean i bec i what, wherever i landed up right it was never by choice my parents chose right you need to study here get a good rank end up in that engineering college get a good rank work in that because campus placement happened ended up in the good companies then you give cat end up in somewhere campus placement happens end up somewhere and stuff like that right and because we are versatile right we will do a good enough job everywhere Right, and uh, because we're doing a good job and stuff like that, we get, kind of get used to that lifestyle. It's very difficult for us to go back to any other lifestyle. All uh, right, and uh, so people go through their entire life without even realizing who they are and what they were capable of, all right? And irrespective of the outcome of the uh, startup journey, right? At the end of it, uh, you, there are times, there are places you feel extremely proud of yourself that you never thought that that existed. And uh, at times you still feel so pathetic and disgusting about yourself. You never thought that you are as bad a person that you actually are, right? And both of them are uh, super, uh, super uh, uh, important. And, uh, and there is no uh, lie there because you know. you know. You don't have to tell it to anybody. You know, you know what you are and stuff like that, right? And, uh, and uh, for whatever reason, right, we essentially double down on our strengths and try to cover our weaknesses by building a team right nobody uh, right start none of us are brought in a way where uh, oh we are good at something so let's not pursue that. Oh, we are bad at something let's try to get better at what we are bad at we don't do that if you're a good coder you go uh, right you double up on your coding skills you don't uh, double up on your sales skills right you find a sales guy Right? If you are a good sales guy, you find a good engineer. Right? So that's what it is. You always develop on this. So for figuring out who you are and what you are and stuff like that, right? Uh, that, that really helps. All right? But coming to the, uh, the emotional aspect of the uh, question, right? I think um, uh, one thing that I realized very late in my uh, entrepreneurial journey was uh, uh, making the entire startup journey a black box to my uh, spouse. Oh, that costed me uh, dearly. Because I'm, I'm in the thick of uh, things in, in the startup. I'm worried about it, uh, right? And, uh, right, you are at home. First of all, you're not at home, uh, right? Whenever you're at home, you're preoccupied. And uh, I, I don't know how many of you are uh, arranged marriages or love marriages. Uh, it's worse in uh, love marriages because you expect the other person to understand. All uh, right, they have no idea what is happening in your life. All right, how would they understand? All uh, right, uh, you're there, so you wanted me to come home, I'm, I'm at home. But I'm uh, sitting at home but uh, worried about something else. So you wanted me to come to this party, oh, I'm at this party. But I, I stand in the corner with a drink in my hand and worried about uh, what do I do tomorrow and stuff like that, right? So that is not, it's not uh, really presence and stuff like that, right? And the spouse expects that you at least give some time and stuff like that, right? And you are forcing yourself to give time when you don't have time. And you don't have a choice but to give time. Right? And uh, the worst thing happens when you have kids. Because you expect they are supposed to understand, but you don't, your kids don't understand. They don't want to understand and they just can't understand. That's where you get into the dilemma, right? But um, over a period of time, I, uh, right, it took me some time to realize that uh, if, because it's a black box, they have no idea. 
but once mm-hmm. i address the black box right so when you start sharing whatever that is happening uh, right about the company and stuff like that they are also wasted so they will not ask you to come home they will not ask you to come and attend come to a, some stupid party they know they do that and once i figured that out so what i started doing it is ask my team members also to start involving their spouses <laughs> all right in the in the in the uh, in the company and stuff like that so then if there is a server that goes down you call the cto the wife uh, would the initially the wife would put the phone on silent so that her husband doesn't wake up all right later once we started involving the spouses right the wife will uh, kick the husband and wake up i think i think the server has gone down again go we'll fix it all uh, uh, right so once we started doing that that started uh, really helping and over a period of time what we did was we started uh, doing um, uh lunch and movie with the spouses mm-hmm. of the senior folks and we also started doing the uh, movie and dinner also with the senior folks right so that uh, again the same same thing that uh, the initial insight that we had right mm-hmm. so people don't want to solve the problems as long as people feel that there are other people also in the same boat no that gives a lot of comfort so the spouses would come together and they would bitch about the company together only <laughs> so and they were so happy that uh, they are not the only ones who are going through everybody else is, uh, else is also going through so that started giving a lot of comfort so the longer we keep uh, things as a black box and stuff like that right so then it becomes a lot of challenges then going home only becomes a, a painful uh, uh, thing i think some of you must have already started experiencing it all right but once you start involving and stuff like that no so it helps one is to not just for this particular person but because you they don't understand the business as much as you do and stuff like that just because you narrating a lot of things get clear in your own head you are not expecting them to solve your problems because you're narrating it to somebody else uh right and they'll also ask to, usually they'll ask stupid questions and because you want to because you and you can't uh, tell your spouse you're asking stupid questions and stuff like that so you try to answer them a lot of things get uh, clear in your own head all right and that gives you a significant amount of strength also so once you start realizing it right you start sharing and you start sharing instead of um, sharing what to do what you don't do and stuff like that to every single person that you guys meet it's better to start sharing it with your spouses only right and with your immediate family members and stuff like that the kids i haven't really figured out a way to solve they don't want to listen uh, right they just want me to <laughs> go every day and come back and give them uh, no my kids are like more the covid babies so they just want to order stuff right just order online order online so i still haven't figured out the how do i deal with the kids problem because uh, when they need me when they need me so they just they are not flexible so spouse was a lot more easier to deal with so whenever she i had time she would manage her time to match my time the kids don't uh, do that so that's that's there so that's that's how uh, do that so if you guys are treating it as a black box with the spouses no please don't do that it is not good for them it's not good for you all uh, right so don't don't randomly and this is unnecessary stress to deal with all right took me a lot of time to uh, get there once i got there it became a lot more uh, easier some of the things that i do with uh, some of the founders that i invest in also right so we also uh, get them to also to participate in some of the things that we do uh, only for, uh, with for uh, founders and stuff like that so that everybody is vested all uh, right and uh, some some simple uh, uh, statistic uh, here right uh, most of the uh, founders uh, that have invested in right a uh, large part of the uh, people have <laughs> left their startup primarily because they went through a divorce right and divorce is the final outcome but uh, not all the is challenges with the spouses ends up in a divorce right and the whole issue started after they started the company uh, right so a lot of people will be going through that right that creates a significant amount of emotional burden right and that is something that uh, at least in india nobody wants to share everyone wants to convey that uh, they are a happily married couple even though it sounds like an oxymoron but uh, that's that's how people wanted to uh, keep it as so the longer we do this uh, the longer it takes for us to come to terms with it and sometimes i think uh, most uh, rather i think the most men realize it when it is too late the women realize it a bit more earlier maybe because they are a lot more mature but uh, we men uh, realize it a bit too late all uh, right so don't don't uh, pay the price when it's not worth to pay that price and that has a huge bearing on your emotional health emotional well being and stuff like that